Hello, everyone, and welcome to this ESCO webinar. I'm Kevin Fox. I'm chairing this session. I'm joining you tonight from Sydney, uh, Gadigal land. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and note that learning has taken place on these lands for millennia, and I look forward to learning something tonight. Uh, we have a, a wonderful speaker, Shatakshi Dongde. She's a, an uh, associate dean at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, Georgia. She's uh, immersed in the world of economic measurement. She's organizing the Society of Economic Measurements Conference in uh, Atlanta, Georgia later this year. And she's also a council member of the International Association for Research and Income and Wealth. And tonight she's going to be talking to us about some of the implications uh, that COVID lockdowns have had on uh, the US population. And uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to uh, Shatakshi uh, to tell us all about it. Over to you, Shatakshi. Oh, I should, sorry, one more thing. Please put your any questions you have in the Q&A and we'll get to them uh, at the end. Thank you, Shatakshi. Thank you, Kevin, uh, for the nice introduction and thank you for the invitation now uh, to give a seminar here at the school. Uh, at some point, I'll be happy to come and meet you all in person and give an in-person seminar. But for the time being, we'll uh, have uh, to do with the webinar. So thanks for all the participants uh, to join us uh, today. I'm going to pull up my slides and start uh, the seminar in a minute. Right. Um, let me know if the slides do not progress or if you don't see the slides. Otherwise, I'm assuming uh, everything is in order and I'll get my talk started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Shatak Shinobe. I'm uh, from Georgia Tech, uh, Atlanta. It's uh, eight o'clock in the morning and I'm uh, so delighted to have my day started uh, with a talk rather than uh, answering emails. So thank you, everyone, for this opportunity. I'm going to present my paper. Uh, this was a uh, recently uh, finished work uh, with Brian Glassman, who's uh, the head of the Poverty Statistics Division at the US Census Bureau. And uh, in this paper, we are looking at uh, measuring multidimensional hardships in the US during the COVID-19 pandemic. We don't need a whole lot of uh, motivation for this. Uh, as you know, US was one of the hardest hit countries uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. And nearly a quarter of the cases detected worldwide uh, were accounted in the country. Between just a matter of a year or so, we found that uh, more than a half, a billion, half a million Americans had lost their lives. And uh, more than a public health crisis, it was also compounded, the hardships were compounded by the accompanying economic crisis in the country. If we look uh, between uh, the start of, during the start of the pandemic, we see that uh, just between March and April of 2020, we saw almost all states, a majority, 43 out of 50 states, issue the lockdown orders. And uh, the economic impact was uh, unemployment soared in the US to almost 15% within a month. Uh, we had 45 million or about one in every seven individuals who were food insecure. And these are just uh, statistics coming from outside agencies where I'm quoting them. And we saw, uh, of course, uh, some of the fallouts of these economic and health shocks that uh, depression levels, for instance, were three times higher than the pre-pandemic year. So all of this sort of triggered uh, the need to see what is happening uh, to the hardships and how can we capture uh, some of those uh, hardships uh, in a more uh, concise and precise fashion. Uh, so this paper is sort of the first one to study the estimate, uh, to study or estimate multidimensional uh, hardships in the U.S. We cover two years from the pandemic, from April 2020 uh, to March 2022. And uh, the interesting part is uh, we use sort of a unique uh, household data set, uh, which was collected by the Census Bureau. Uh, I wish my co-author was here to tell you a whole lot about the data set, but this was a... Uh, 
monthly data set. In fact, uh, in some weeks of the pandemic, it was almost collected on a weekly basis. And that's the reason why it's called the pulse. It was a pulse check on the economy, on households, how they are coping up with these uh, uh, shocks to the economy uh, starting in April 2020. And it went all the way till where we stop in March 2022. Uh, we look at hardships in multiple ways. Uh, whatever uh, data we had, our indicators are sort of constrained because of that. Uh, we don't have sufficient information, for instance, on income, uh, but we do have information on job insecurity. We look at uh, food insufficiency uh, among households. Uh, what is their housing insecurity and mental health? So I'll talk about each one of these, but just to give you a quick overlap. Uh, we look in the paper uh, into details about how these hardships changed uh, by regions, across states, by gender, by race and ethnicity. So that's sort of to give you a big picture view. A uh, bit of a motivation about why are we looking at multidimensional measures. Uh, it, the literature is going way back uh, to almost uh, Amartya Sen's uh, philosophical uh, writings about talking about capabilities rather than incomes or uh, rather than a standard of living. How can we measure an individual's uh, well-being coming out from his or her capability to function in the society? And in that, uh, it, there is a nice definition of poverty where uh, he notes that poverty is the absence of one or more more of the basic capabilities needed to achieve minimal functioning in the society. Uh, the approach has been uh, well known and uh, it's looking at lack of endowment in terms of say education, in terms of uh, health insurance and so on, rather than just an outcome which can be an income. Uh, as many of you in this audience would know that uh, though the approach uh, talks about uh, well-being in that uh, sense of capabilities and functionings, it's much difficult to bring it uh, in empirical practice where we want to capture some of these. And uh, you can recall way back uh, when uh, the Human Development Report used to publish the Human Poverty Index uh, during the 1997 to almost uh, for 10 years till 2009. And uh, it was an index looking not at income, rather, but looking at deprivations in health, education, and standard of living. In 2010, uh, this HPI index was substituted or replaced by the UNDR, and was uh, a new index was created, which was called the Multidimensional Poverty Index. And the index was sort of uh, proposed the axiomatic framework of this index was proposed uh, by Alkair and Foster in 2011 uh, in two of their papers. Uh, but the HDR sort of started publishing it and making it much widely known by using data across countries. Uh, and now more than 100 countries, they published the global MPI in developing countries uh, for the last 10 years or so. So this is not a new index in any way. Multidimensional Poverty Index has been accepted and published annually, not just by uh, the UNDP, but also some of the national statistical offices uh, in these different countries. What has been in the US is sort of for paucity or a late development in um, measuring multidimensional poverty in uh, the US. And I won't walk you through the entire table, but you see that our first estimates uh, we provided were in 2017. So we came to the party a bit late. Uh, we looked at the Great Recession and how multidimensional poverty estimates uh, changed during the recession. How did they match uh, income poverty levels? So that was sort of the first study in the US. It looked at the American Com Community Survey, the ACS, which is one of the largest uh, household level surveys in the country. And that paper was followed by different papers where uh, in the next one in 2019, we proposed a different index than the al qaeda Foster Index. Uh, Glassman, who's my co-author on this paper, is uh, at the Census Bureau and he started looking at uh, census data sets like CPS and trying to compare how multidimensional poverty in the US uh, changed over time. 
Uh, we did have a follow-up uh, on our 2017 paper in 2022, uh, where we did it sort of the most comprehensive study so far and looked at uh, more than 10 years and uh, much more regionally in terms of MSAs and smaller units in, for measuring multidimensional poverty. The last one I've highlighted, because I think that's sort of the most relevant one, that is the only paper uh, which uh, we did uh, in 2021 looking at the pandemic. So this was looking at a small survey done by the Federal Reserve Bank in April 2020. It was only a one-month survey that they did. Uh, it's called the SHED survey. And it looked at what was changing in that one month of pandemic where the pandemic, uh, the lockdown happened and what happened to the economic well-being. So that was the only paper uh, in the literature so far, which was looking at uh, or giving you a quick glimpse into the pandemic. So our paper sort of uh, moves ahead or moves forward this literature, looking at uh, this literature, but looking at a bigger window or longer window on the pandemic. And uh, we look at two years, two complete years of the pandemic and consider uh, different indicators than what that uh, PLOS One paper was doing. So what are the imp important features of this paper? The most important one I would say is the data because that was something which was lacking in terms of the APS and CPS, uh, which are more of the annual data sets that uh, we had access to this uh, monthly household pulse survey conducted by the census and other agencies. Uh, at some point, it was done at a weekly, bi-weekly basis. We do it monthly because the frequencies change and monthly is a bit more consistent. Uh, it's a repeated cross-section of of uh, almost 3.4 million respondents. And we go into the paper into details of how the data was collected. It was collected uh, for adults only, so 18 years and above, and looking at uh, 15 of the largest MSAs or the census units uh, across different states. We do want to mention some of the limitations of the data, and uh, we do uh, make sure that uh, we inform the readers about that, uh, that this data was collected by phone or email address. So of course, households who had access to these were the only ones which were included. Uh, we had information, so the data, the survey was asking about the person who was responding to the survey and not about uh, what is happening to other household members. So it's very specific to the person who is responding to the survey questions. Uh, during the pandemic, you can imagine there were not always greatly high response rates. And I just note here in short, what were the some of the non-responses uh, for the indicators that we have? We had the largest one on mental well-being uh, that people used to pass the question, not answer it. Uh, we had smaller ones on say, job insecurity or housing insecurity. And in the paper, we detailed that either we remove the non-responses and then estimate, or we do some adjustments to the non-responses in the sense that uh, we do a regression model and say, looking at these characteristics, what would have been the case, uh, and then measure the estimate. So we sort of try to make you the best use of the data that we have here. Uh, the hardship indicators, uh, what are these? These are, we are looking at four, and as I said, we sort of uh, exhausted what we had from that Pulse survey in looking at these four. There weren't many others that we could have uh, included for the entire of the two years and at a monthly uh, basis. So looking at job insecurity, mainly you can think of this as unemployment, uh, not having worked in the last seven days, for pay or profit. Uh, of course, we exclude adults who had retired or uh, people who were not seeking jobs actively. Uh, we look at food insufficiency sometimes or often did not have enough food to eat in the last seven days. Uh, and that's sort of the standard definition of USDA when they are measuring food insufficiency. Housing insecurity was looking at uh, you had slight or no confidence in your ability to make the mortgage or rent payments for the next month. And then mental uh, well-being or a lack, in fact, of mental health was feeling down or depressed or hopeless for more than half or nearly every day in the previous week. So these, as you see, are much stricter uh, ways in which you want to define some of these hard 
relationships. Again, in the paper, we change some of these definitions and say, let's look at mental uh, lack of mental health, not more than half, but uh, even for a few days in a week, if they are mentioning that, what happens or food insufficiencies, what happens if they did not have uh, the type of food they really wanted to eat and then what happens to the measure. So uh, like any other multidimensional poverty indices, the measures are uh, going to change. The estimates are going to change when we change some of these definitions. And that sort of helps you just get um, an idea of the range in which these measures or these estimates can move. So just looking at the dashboard of these hardships and uh, how did they look at the pandemic, what we have on that uh, axis below is monthly data starting from April 2020. That's where sort of uh, the pandemic became well known. We had a few cases in March, but the first lockdown happened in April 20. 2020. And we start to the HPS started at that point. We did not have the HPS uh, for the previous months. And we go all the way till March 2022. You see four different uh, hardships and trends between them. A broad pattern is there was much uh, higher levels in uh, the first year of the pandemic, uh, 2020, all the way from April to December. And then slowly these hardships tended to converge or go down. Uh, there were peaks in almost each one of these indicators. Uh, one peak was in July 2020. Uh, that was where we had, and I'll show you another graph where we have the sort of the highest number of COVID cases also. Uh, and the second wave of the pandemic was in December 2020, again, where hardships sort of pull up and we see a peak. There was another peak uh, somewhere closer to January 2022, which was the Omicron variant. And interestingly, we see a small rise, but not a whole lot like we did earlier on. And that was mostly, I'll explain later on, is that the economic shock was much more cushioned for the latest uh, variant in 2022 than the previous one. So these were sort of the rough uh, patches uh, in terms of well-being. On average, if you see the food insufficiency levels, uh, that's the blue line, that average level was about 10.6% of adults uh, noted that they had food insufficiency. Job insecurity was the highest hardship, and that's the red line. And that was on average almost 18%, 17.5%, which are very comparable to the numbers of what we see with, in terms of the BLS. We look at housing insecurity, about 11%, uh, that's the gray line, and then mental health, which was again very high, and that's the yellow line which you see at the top, that uh, a large proportion of population, almost one in five adults uh, on average throughout these two years, noted, uh, recall that mental lack of mental health was uh, telling that uh, you had uh, feeling down or uh, depression symptoms for more than half of the previous week or almost the entire previous week. I'm going to walk you quickly through uh, some of the measures that we are doing, but I'll say quickly in the sense we don't want to go too much into details, uh, but uh, maybe uh, if you're not familiar with the methods instead of the notation, look at the example that may help uh, just a numerical illustration for you to know what we are doing. So suppose we have uh, five individuals, so that n is equal to five, and I'm looking at uh, four different indicators or dimensions uh, for hardship. That's the case in our paper where we are looking at d equals four. Let's just assume for the sake uh, of uh, simplicity that we equal put equal weights. You do not have to put equal weights for each of the indicators. In our context, we did not feel that the weights should change, uh, that there was uh, not a pressing need for one indicator to be highly weighted over the other. So we treat them with equal weights. Uh, what uh, the index is going to do, and this is following the Alkair Foster counting approach, so I'm not getting into uh, any of the nice properties, but just telling you that we are counting uh, the number of hardships experienced by an individual. So we are going to prepare a hardship indicator or a hardship matrix. That's the G matrix you see on the top. 
And uh, you'll see that that matrix uh, has five individuals. So it's a matrix by the dimension of N times D and four hardships. For each individual, you can think of that as the row. And you'll see that looking at the achievement uh, with the threshold, the once we defined earlier on in terms of how do we define whether an individual faced uh, housing insecurity or not. Depending on whether they were able to pay the mortgage or rent, uh, they would face the insecurity as one. Otherwise, it will be coded as zero. So this is the first individual who has uh, two hardships. In the second row, you see there is another individual who had hardship in the first indicator and the second indicator and so on. The third in individual in this example has all four hardships, in fact, and the fourth one has only one hardship. So it's a one zero coding right now. Uh, once you have created this using the indicators and using the thresholds for these indicators, you're going to collapse all of this information and say, what was the sum total of the hardships? Because you want to see what is the overlap of these hardships. Uh, the first individual had two, uh, the third individual had four, and so on. Once we add those together, I'm getting these as the hardship scores. And this is where uh, I've put in red that there is another adjustment which is happening, is now we have to define who are the individuals who are facing multiple hardships. Taking the word literally as multiple hardships, suppose we say that let k be equal to two, so anyone who's facing two or more hardships will be termed as a multidimensionally poor individual. I'm going to give a score of zero for this fourth individual because uh, she had only one hardship. And I'm going to retain all the other uh, scores. This matrix is now called what we call as the censored uh, hardship matrix vector because of that zero adjustment. Now I'm putting another threshold in terms of how many hardships to calculate. Once I have this censored score, uh, the easiest way for me to get an index is take the average, right? Take the average of this score. So I'm adding out all the scores, individual one's hardship was two, two, four, z zero and three, the total score is 11. I divided by five times four, which would be the maximum possible hardships faced by a society, right? Five individuals, four indicators, so that's 20. And I get what we call as the adjusted headcount ratio, okay? So that's sort of the main index, the adjusted headcount ratio, giving you the average of the sensor deprivation index. When we estimate this um, index and uh, show you, I'll show you in a minute what are the monthly uh, values of this, but uh, it's a bit hard to keep on talking about this adjusted headcount ratio. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, a nice property of this adjusted headcount uh, index where it can be shown as a product of two indicators. One is the headcount ratio and another is the average intensity ratio. So what is the headcount ratio? The headcount ratio is giving me using this censored matrix, how many people in the population did I identify as multidimensional poor, right? Remember there were two thresholds, one for each indicator and one for counting k equals two, anyone with two or more hardships. So in my example, I had four individuals who were uh, out of five who were identified as multidimensional poor. And this is the one I'm going to use. This is very similar to our uh, poverty index, right? That I'm looking at the total population and what is the proportion of individuals in that population who had multiple hardships. Uh, the adjusted headcount ratio is a product of this Q over N and the average intensity index, uh, which is giving me, I'll walk you quickly on this one. It's still giving me the score, the entire score of the censored matrix, but it's dividing it not by the total hardships for the population, instead by the total hardships faced by the multidimensional poor people. So I'm taking the product of uh, four individuals with four hardships, that would be 16. So maximum possible hardships among these MPI population, and that will give me their average uh, deprivation among the poor. So quickly on this one, no need to uh, worry if you do not remember each one of these indices. I'll uh, show you one table and then we'll switch on to just the headcount ratio uh, so that it's much easier to see. So what we have here are, uh, in fact, a high frequency estimates uh, where 
all of the previous studies were giving us annual estimates of uh, poverty. Here uh, in the pandemic, we did monthly estimates. And you'll see at the red, I'm showing you the peaks of uh, each one of these values. The MHI is the first two columns are giving me the head count ratio. And that is telling me that at the peak, when we had uh, the peak of the pandemic, uh, almost 20% or one in five individuals had more than two deprivations. Again, in December uh, 2020, that rises to 20%. But by the time we go to the end of the survey and end of the pandemic, that had come down to about 13%. So over a period of time, we had 16.3% uh, Americans on average in these two years who had experienced two or more hardships. You can look at the average intensity index, and that also peaks around the same time. Uh, that one is giving me the average of the deprivation scores. And this is the adjusted headcount ratio, which we started working with, which is the product of the first two indices. So looking at this pattern, let me show you a the composition of hardships, because more than two tells us only that they faced multiple hardships, but what were the hardships that were faced by uh, the adults in the survey? What we find is that the most common hardship, uh, that's uh, what I'm showing in these different columns, is what are the different possible ways? We have only four indicators, so job insecurity and food insufficiency, or food insufficiency and housing insecurity, and so on. Uh, we find that the most common hardship is over here, where adults uh, face job insecurity and a lack of mental health. And that was sort of expected in the pandemic, that uh, unemployment levels soared, and that created uh, a lot of mental stress, which was captured by this data. So that way, it's an interesting data set, which captures the mental well-being of the population. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, let's look at some of the trends in these uh, multidimensional poverty index compared to the income poverty. So again, in this graph, all I'm showing are the percentage of uh, people who are identified as income poor by the official poverty measure. The official poverty measures uh, were all annual. Uh, so we use an independent uh, researchers who did monthly estimates of these poverty levels. But those are the OPM or what we see that red line. And over the period, as you saw, uh, in the US, poverty remained more or less stubbornly high and did not uh, decrease for the last, uh, for the two years of the pandemic. Uh, it was almost somewhere between 10 and a half to 11 and a half percent. We also plot the supplemental poverty measure, uh, which is also published by the Census Bureau. And that takes into account a more nuanced measure of income. And I'll be happy to talk about it uh, later in our discussions. But uh, it takes into account uh, some of the safety net programs and it adjusts for taxes and so on. So that measure is going to be higher than the official poverty measure during the pandemic, but it shows some decrease in the later on years. Our multidimensional headcount index, right, the MHI is showing the proportion of people who faced multiple dimensions uh, or multiple hardships, and that is almost uh, higher than both of these poverty measures. And you'll see it peaks, and then there is a good amount of decrease in the measure as we go towards the end of the pandemic. I have plotted on the other side, just to give you an idea of what was happening to the pandemic, what was happening to the number of COVID cases. And you will see, in fact, that the Omicron uh, variant was the strongest one, which happened in the late 2022, uh, in the early 2022, late 2021. And that's where we see a large uh, pie. But we, of course, had the July peak in at the start of the pandemic and the December peak uh, also. And that sort of uh, gives you an idea how the health shock was happening. The straight lines here are giving you the stimulus packages. And I wanted to bring this part of the story also uh, to tell you that even if the pandemic peaked later on, we already had some safety net programs. And that's why you don't see a whole lot of increase in poverty, either as income poverty or multidimensional poverty happening uh, when the Omicron uh, variant happened, that there were stimulus packages, three of those happening. Uh, between April 2020 and March 2021. So I have mentioned some of those, uh, but the details are there in the paper. 
quickly giving you some of the results. Uh, we look at statewide variation. Uh, the, the numbers I've shown you so far were national and monthly levels. Uh, we do show the monthly estimates for each of the 50 states, but just looking at the big picture, you'll see that the South uh, had high levels of multidimensional hardships uh, and the West, California and Nevada were also some with the some of the highest numbers. And we had uh, the state of New York, which uh, saw much uh, higher and the dark blue is showing, uh, if you can't see on the slide, it's 17 and a half percent or higher population uh, experiencing hardships during those this average during those two years. We do look at racial and ethnic differences between the poverty levels, uh, and we look uh, estimate those by using a linear uh, probability model, where I'm looking at why is going to be the hardship, like were you facing housing insufficiency or job insecurity, food insufficiency, and so on. I is denoting individuals, J is denoting the states of uh, residents, T is denoting the survey month. And then what we are looking at uh, is the race. So six different racial groups uh, using the census's usual classification, whites, blacks, Asians, uh, others, Hispanics. Uh, we look at uh, some of the individual characteristics and control for those in terms of, again, depending on the data, we had age and gender, marital status, and education. We did not have enough or sufficient information on income. And we do realize that that was sort of a, uh, a factor which was not controlled here. We control for household characteristics, number of COVID cases, and also some of the government programs that I mentioned earlier on. So what do we see in terms of the racial differences? Not walking through the entire table, but let's just look at uh, the top panel of this table. And we see that by each hardship, which was the population which had a greater probability of facing the hardships. So compared, the reference group here is uh, white adults. Compared to white adults, uh, we see that uh, uh, black adults had a much higher probability, statistically significantly higher probability of facing each of the first three hardships, job insecurity, food insufficiency, and housing insecurity. Um, they had a negative uh, probability in the sense that uh, the coefficient, not probability, the coefficient is negative in the sense that the white adults had a much higher probability compared to the black in reporting lack of mental illness. And that is what you'll see in all. Uh, of these rows is the white adults were uh, reporting much higher lack of mental health uh, parts than other racial groups. Uh, we do see Hispanics very similar to the black population with high hardship levels compared to the white population. Uh, the Asians fared uh, much better than whites, uh, sorry, than blacks and Hispanics. And you'll see that their uh, probabilities were much smaller. If we go by individual characteristics, not walking you through all of these, but if uh, our reference rate age group, I'm comparing my probabilities to that reference uh, age group of 18 to 29 years, that was the group, again, facing uh, most of the mental stress, where we'll see these negative numbers for other uh, age groups. If we look at uh, household characteristics uh, or if we look at the government programs, we are controlling for all of these and uh, we see the correct signs in terms of the economic impact payments, the earned the income tax credit for children, all of them help lower some of the probabilities on these uh, hardships. Let's look at the combination. Again, what we see is uh, some interesting results where we are seeing that a particular type of people uh, had hardships in a particular combination. And uh, for the Blacks, we'll see that uh, that was food insufficiency and housing insecurity, where the probability was much higher. Uh, compared to if you see into the Hispanic population, you'll see that it was more on job insecurity, right? So there is food insufficiency versus job insecurity. And we talk a bit more about why that was the case and what uh, happened when other studies were looking at some of those. Keeping track, I'm coming uh, to the last uh, couple of slides. Uh, just to summarize uh, what we do in this paper is we examine uh, the extent of hardships. 
uh, experienced by Americans during the last two years of the pandemic. And uh, we look at the overlap. We are not interested really in the dashboard, but more into what was, uh, what were the multiple hardships faced by each individual, because that sort of affects your well-being to a much larger extent. We used a very well-timed micro-level uh, data, and that helped us uh, get a glimpse of what was happening. It was called the Household Pulse Survey. Uh, we found that 16.3% uh, Americans on average experienced multiple hardships during uh, the two years. And uh, the hardship sort of looked, peaked or followed the trends of the COVID-19 cases, except for the last week in the Omicron uh, variant. Uh, the combination which was most commonly experienced uh, was a lack of mental health and job insecurity. And uh, the hardships were more prevalent in the southern and western states. Differences by race and ethnicity were significant. We found that Black and Hispanics were more likely to experience hardships uh, in the three indicators. Whites were more likely to report hardship in uh, mental health. We go into a bit of details into what were the stimulus packages and how they helped uh, push in some of these shocks. And we do see that uh, even though the HPS does not ask uh, information on were you receiving uh, some of these relief uh, checks, uh, we can estimate them looking at their uh, previous uh, income status. And we do see that uh, packages like the economic payments, uh, impact payments, or looking at the child tax credit, that those helped reduce food insufficiency, housing insecurity uh, among households, or unemployment insurance, of course, helped reduce the job insecurity or the mental stress that uh, people were feeling. Uh, so there was some evidence that these packages actually helped uh, reduce the economic shock, especially when we went to uh, the later on uh, pandemic peak. So with that, uh, I'll conclude my uh, discussion. I'll stop sharing the screen and move on to Kevin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shitakshi. Uh, that was great. Um, we have a discussant, uh, Suman Seth from Leeds University and an incoming editor of the Review of Income and Wealth. Over to you, Suman. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Uh, let me upload my um, presentation. Uh, can you see the screen, please? Yeah, okay, perfect. Uh, so as always, uh, Satakshi, very clear presentation. Uh, so thank you so much. And uh, uh, it was a very interesting paper to read actually, because I do not get to read a lot of work on multidimensional poverty uh, on the United States, okay? So you are sort of living uh, in that um, area. Um, there are different interesting aspects of the paper. The first one, as, as you said, high frequency data. I, I wrote it at uh, the bottom, but probably that's very interesting because you do not get this high frequency data uh, you know, so quickly. I mean, we generally rely on surveys and surveys come in, you know, every um, five years or so. Um, yes, the study of hardship during the COVID-19 pandemic, it's, it's very important. We have all lived that experience in different countries and every country had uh, uh, sort of try to cope in their own ways. Uh, you still vividly remember the pictures from the developing countries, India, uh, you know, uh, uh, as well as in Europe, as well as, you know, in Spain, in UK, in the US, and they are just in our memory. And uh, so studying uh, the impact of that uh, pandemic on people's life, especially through a slightly different lens uh, than just income is quite crucial. And of course, looking at the composition and the joint distribution of hardship is certainly important. And you look at uh, four key dimensions. Uh, they are also linked to capabilities, as you rightly pointed out, job insecurity, food insufficiency, housing, um, as well as mental health. Yeah. So, um, and then, of course, you show uh, the compositions by um, states, by race, ethnicity, age group, 
and different fragments. So yeah, it's quite informative in that sense. So uh, what I will do, I will try to um, sort of provide some observations um, as well as uh, some food for thoughts, maybe for some future work and so on and what else could have been done. Um, so one thing, um, when I was reading the paper, something that I was very curious and probably to, there could be um, at least a graph or a table uh, to show the distribution of these joint distributions. So how many were you know, deprived in one, two, three, four. I know you are doing multi, uh, multi-dimensional analysis, but despite that, it would be good to know how many were one, how many were two, how many were three, how many, because when you did your, um, uh, your cutoff, which was two, even after that, your average deprivation was coming to be 2.4, and it did not vary quite a lot. So it looks like that you probably had a quite of clubbing on one or two deprivations rather than going in, in, in three and four. So it looks like most had one or two um, hardship. Um, the other one was uh, the MHI, you know, decomposition by states. So now if we look at this color coding, of course, it looks like uh, we have this mid Northwest, um, which much lighter color um, and sort of I, was a bit curious and it could have been probably explored uh, a bit more. Um, what was the exact reason? Is, is it that the government packages uh, worked much better over there? Uh, they were much low density population over there. So COVID spread was not as significant as in California, New York. We still remember, you know, the case of New York, how, how difficult it was. So was the existence of bigger cities versus small town versus much more rural area, did they play any role? You know, so it's it sort of probably would have been explored a bit more. I mean, of course, you understand if you look at South, if you have Georgia, Texas, uh, uh, you know, uh, Arkansas or Florida and so on. Of course, I can understand that deprivation rate probably was much significantly higher in poorer state, which is understandable. But then a bit more explanation why, what other factors could have been responsible, could have been more done, or maybe in future, you have some ideas you could do, you write another paper in future exploring that. Um, some findings were expected when you do the regression analysis, such as, uh, uh, you know, some indicators where you have Hispanics population, black population, they were kind of, their probability of facing some deprivations were higher. Uh, but mental health deprivation results sort of uh, arouse some curiosity, yeah? Uh, so where I thought you could look at the interactions a bit more. So when I was reading that mental health issues were sort of the probability of facing mental health were higher among whites, who is the majority of the population. So I was trying to think it's, it's, it's a big chunk. So it's saying uniformly it's higher for the white, um, sort of definitely would raise some questions, who among the white? Was it uh, uh, region specific uh, in cities or people, uh, you know, of you show different age group, but that age composition of 18 to 29 included everybody. So I could not see whether it was sort of higher among the white youth, yeah? So I think uh, a bit more uh, exploration among the interactions between these different categories would probably flesh out a much clearer uh, picture. Similarly, you mentioned in the paper that respondents in the households without children were more likely to report mental health hardship. Again, who were these? Because there could be young couples who may not have children, there could be elderly, and the young couples, they could suffer from loss of employment much more rather than the elderly couple. Elderly couple, uh, as we recall, the main problem elderly faced, faced that uh, they could not go to groceries, they could not go to shop, people were not there to help them. So it's different kind of issues these different groups face. And again, they all come in the same category of doing different interactions. 
and sort of trying to understand not just joint deprivations, but as well as how these different characteristics may have contributed to higher deprivation. Now, of course, in your table, uh, the footnote, you mentioned that you control for fixed effect uh, for by month and as well as by state, if I if I've read correctly. And then I was thinking because you have nearly 3 million observations. And of course, United States, it's, it's a big country. Even within a particular state, there is a lot of variation. Was it at all possible to look at our control for the fixed effect at a much more disaggregated level? I'm not sure if you could do it, but if you look at California, if you look at New York City versus the city of New York versus outside New York, it will be a massive difference. Yeah, so, so within state, there will be a lot of variations. So whether it would be at all possible to look at, you know, control for those fixed effect and look at the robustness um, of um, your result. So I think some of these things could be explored, could have been explored more in the paper. And of course, you know, a paper is not the end of it. You can definitely do further experiment to explore them uh, in future. What would get, what, what would have happened? Um, a brief, some of the minor methodological issues. Um, um, I like your, when you, when you, in your paper, you said, you know, what does this 0.61 of average intensity index mean? Oh, it means 2.4 deprivations, you know, and so on. I think it's, it's fine to report it as 2.4. Rather, I know for uh, technicalities, you want to probably report uh, these two index. So as a, as the product is the adjusted discount ratio, but in our book, uh, the 2015 book, uh, we actually present, and this is why we presented Neat table where we try to show four different ways. In one way, you can present these average deprivations not normalized because it's much more intuitive. So how you can club them, you know, one with other to represent. So so it's I think it's fine to just uh, present as two point four uh, the average rather than point six. It is it's much more intuitive to understand. Um, in your presentation, you explain very clearly, but then in the paper, it, the, it sort of tried to present the AHI at some point, the total hardship as a share of the maximum possible hardship. I think you probably should have added experience by the multi, which you explained very well in your uh, presentation. But in the paper, when I read, when I was reading, it says total hardship as a proportion of maximum possible, but you have used a cutoff, the cutoff of two. So it is only by the multidimensionally poor and, 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 and that's all. And then final curiosity, I didn't see you using, I mean, whenever you reported say across states, you use the multidimensional headcount ratio, not that just a headcount ratio. Also in your regression, yes, into, it was intuitive to look at the probabilities, but I never saw you using the cardinal scores themselves. Yet, of course, you have discussed in the theoretical section why one ought to look at the adjusted headcount ratio going beyond the multidimensional headcount ratio. So that was another curiosity why, I mean, even with one table, you know, just additional column with the results, probably again, it's kind of another robustness, robust idea to, to say, you know, it works like that. But, but yeah, I enjoyed reading the paper. Thank you so much. I hope Kevin, I'm on time. Yes, great. That was great, Suman. Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, maybe we'll just take a minute. Uh, Shitakshi, would you like to respond to any of the points raised by Suman? Uh, no, well, thank you so much, Suman, uh, for reading the paper <laughs> uh, and giving all these suggestions. I mean, these are suggestions, just, they are going to help uh, us explore it uh, much more. Uh, there is nothing I can refute about. I think we tried looking at fixed effects at MSAs. Uh, there are 15 MSAs where the data was collected. Uh, there was some problem in terms of how representatives the MSAs were with the national uh, population. And that's where we went uh, with the state level. And But I'll check uh, once again to look into that part. Uh, the, part uh, where you mention uh, one or two or three hardships, that's absolutely true. And in fact, uh, we have uh, later on explored that. Uh, on average, uh, it's largely two or three. We don't get a whole lot of uh, population with all four hardships uh, into that. I love the idea of interaction for mental health, right? That we would like to definitely look at 
even within the white, uh, looking at the, the composition, right, child or with child have household or not, even marital status or the age will matter uh, into those and we can definitely explore that. Uh, another comment uh, which sort of relates to this is uh, that mental health was reported, right? And uh, there may be racial differences on who reports a lack of mental health. So we sort of caution people saying that it, other uh, racial groups may have experienced it, but were, uh, as we saw, the non-response rate was much higher on that lack of mental health. But that's an interesting uh, uh, idea to explore that uh, deprivation much uh, further. The state variation, and that is where uh, exactly we paused and said maybe this is an idea for the next one, is why do we see the state variation? It's not very different from what you see in terms of poverty. And you noticed that, right? The southern states are the ones which have high poverty levels with Louisiana, Missouri, uh, Mississippi, and so on. And we see almost a similar overlap. Uh, of course, New York and California are also included uh, with high multidimensional deprivation ones. Uh, what we started getting uh, sort of uh, where I said that it may be a different idea for a different paper is that the state level policies changed even within states and the HPS did not have that much of a variation or within states. I mean, I come from Georgia, we had very different lockdown in Atlanta versus the rest of the state. So perhaps we can use something like the Oxford stringency index, right, uh, which did it by months by state, not within, but at least if we get it by states in the US, looking at that stringency index, can we explain some of this variation? That would be uh, a neater way to do this. Uh, the limitation which I mentioned also earlier on in the HPS is we don't know who received them. They don't ask, were you receiving the uh, EIP or the unemployment insurance? So what we had to do is sort of look at uh, their income brackets from before the pandemic and then uh, impute that they may be the ones uh, who are receiving those. But definitely, uh, we'll, uh, we'll take that into account and at least uh, put a bit more uh, reasoning of as to why the state variation happened. Uh, looking at the indices, you're right, I'm a bit more partial uh, always to the <laughs> percent uh, population, but of course the others are uh, more important and we can always put more tables on those. Uh, it just becomes a bit uh, harder, but thanks for your book reference. I'm going to look at that. Harder to explain uh, uh, the other two indices and we can definitely do that. So thank you, thanks. Thanks so much uh, for those. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Thanks to both of you. Uh, we have, uh, well, a comment and two questions from Isatu Sa. So, uh, Isatu, perhaps you, you could unmute and ask uh, uh, one, your most pressing question first, and we'll see if we have time for uh, the others. So, can you unmute, Isatu? Apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, we can't hear you. Can you unmute? I've given permission no. to unmute, but I think they have technical issues, so you might have to read out the questions. Okay. All right. Well, um, let, let me just take, there's a, uh, uh, I think, a uh, couple of statements there now, but let, let me take the first question that I see there. Uh, what are the policy initiatives to curb the psychological stress due to financial challenges faced during COVID-19? Uh, well, let, let me make that a bit broader because I was wondering about policy initiatives as well, that you know, there were quite different policies across the different states with certainly the governor of Florida um, touting that his state got things right, yet I look at your results and it seems like there was a lot of hardship in Florida. Um, so perhaps you, you know, is your study going to look at the effectiveness of certain policies at mitigating the hardships that have arisen during the, the COVID pandemic? Right. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Kevin. And uh, thanks also to for the question. Uh, there was no policy response as such in terms of mental well-being, apart from uh, making uh, in some places uh, counselors were put in place or were made available uh, 
without uh, out of pocket expenses but those were uh, some of the initiatives done by say private employers or universities and schools uh, once uh, people came back to their jobs that uh, some of those counseling services were available but it was not uh, like a stimulus package that there was any a policy change around mental well-being. I think uh, Kevin's question is uh, much uh, broader in the sense of uh, what were happening at state level policies, right? Uh, and uh, yes, I think uh, we have a nice uh, paper idea now that uh, I gave the seminar here that I think uh, there is much more interest in the state level uh, parts. Uh, the Hard one is the HPS, as I mentioned, uh, does not capture so much at within state variation. Uh, it was done in 15 uh, large MSAs, and so we don't have uh, much information along the states. But now that we are out of the pandemic for almost two years, we do have the annual data. We do have the CPS and ACS coming in, uh, which are annual, but which are much more uh, dense uh, within state representation. They have much better representation uh, of the statewide population. Uh, the policies changed a lot. And you, as you rightly noted, it was not clear whether states which had less lockdown had higher hardships or vice versa. Both New York and Florida were very contrasting in terms of their state level policies and both had pretty high hardship levels. Um, California was also very similar looking to New York but the density was much lower. So the number of cases uh, in terms of deaths were much lower in California than compared to New York. Uh, so it, it is a bit tricky to use this type of data to answer those uh, those questions. But uh, definitely now with uh, the annual census is coming out, we'll be able to do much more in terms of what were the state level policies which uh, helped mitigate some of these hardships. Great. Um, thanks for that. So uh, Isitu has some other comments there in the Q&A about um, policy interventions and what can be done. But let, let me just try and um, summarize those in, into a broader question of what have we learned from your results that might be used to help inform the development of policies in preparation for any future pandemic? Uh Nice question, Kevin, and uh, as economists, so we are always hesitant, right, to give those policy prescriptions. Uh, one thing uh, we did mention in the paper also is that uh, the stimulus packages helped, uh, and that's where uh, we had a separate sort of section on those. Uh, we don't, we are not showing any causality that this policy helped reduce this hardship, but we could see just by looking at uh, the correlations, right, that with the stimulus packages, uh, the deprivations with all the three in place went down in all different indicators in all of the four uh, hardships. And those sort of helped cushion the shock which we had. So there was a natural experiment uh, happening in terms of the Omicron variant uh, in the late 2021, December, January 2022, uh, where in fact the cases were much higher, but the response was much different. Uh, there were no immediate lockdowns. There was no immediate loss of employment employment. Uh, so some of it was also a lesson learned by the policymakers on how to react uh, to a much larger uh, health shock that uh, we did not go into a very uh, shocking way of putting down everything, uh, people losing jobs. We did not see a rise in unemployment to that extent. And uh, what we did see was uh, this survey doesn't capture, but we are now looking at the CPS and ACS, is we do see a slight uptick uh, as these packages uh, started the waning out or as they expired, the extra or the advanced uh, earned income tax credit expired uh, later on in 2022. And we do see slight uptick uh, happening around that time uh, where some of these uh, things uh, started waning out. And of course, that sort of indicates that all of these are giving you indications that the stimulus packages uh, did help uh, the population, uh, that uh, they had some impact at least 
containing the economic shock, which would have gone without them. We don't have the counterfactual, but which may have remained as high as the first year. Uh, the lockdowns, of course, uh, things were different because the lockdown measures also eased. So that also helped reduce some of the economic shocks. Uh, and uh, I think the lessons learned, uh, we did learn some lessons right after a year or a year and a half in the pandemic in the terms of how we want to react to some of these, at least in terms of economics, right? Not talking in terms of any uh, expertise in uh, public health, but uh, the muted response that we saw in terms of the Omicron variant really helped to see that the economy kept going despite those uh, larger peaks happening later on in the pandemic. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Shitakushi. Uh, we're out of time, so I'm sure everyone uh, joins me in, in thanking uh, both our speaker and our discussant. And um, I hope that you continue to do this work because uh, it seems to be very important. So um, thanks very much, everyone. And uh, it's 1 a.m. in Sydney. So yes, good thank night you, Kevin. Me. I was going to mention Thank you so that. much, Kevin. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Wouldn't have missed it for anything. Yeah, thank you. See you, everyone. Thank you very oh, much. See you. Thanks so much. Bye, Bye-bye.